Welcome to Bridging Voices, the video podcast series of the Konrad Arnau Foundation's Multinational Development Policy Dialogue Program here in Brussels. My name is Janne Leino, and I work as a program manager for foreign affairs and security issues here at CAS. And I'm very happy today to meet two distinguished uh, experts, with whom we are going to talk about China-EU relations from the economical point of view. First, I would like to start with the ladies. Uh, I'm happy to greet you, Luisa Santos. You are the Deputy Director General for Business Europe. And just thank you for having the time to join us. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. MEP Julio Winkler, you are the Vice Chair of the Trade Committee in the European Parliament and the Standing Rapporteur on China. So a lot of expertise on trade in China. Welcome and thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. And uh, just uh, to be very precise, I'm one of the Vice Chairs of the International Trade Committee. One of the vice chairs of the International Trade Committee. Very good. I would like to start the discussion just with a, a, a small, small icebe- icebreaker. So uh, we talk about EU-China relations. I'm very interested to hear when did you come in contact with China the first time? And, and was it trade already or was it something else? Maybe mm-hmm. we started with Luisa. Well, the first time was food, of course, because uh, when I was a very young child, I started eating Chinese food. So I think that was the first experience. Work-wise was on trade. Uh, I started my life in textiles and of course at that time we were negotiating the entrance of China in the WTO and also the dismantling of the quotas that we have for imports of, of textiles from China. So that was my first professional encounter with China. Food and culture. How long ago was this? Five years, ten years ago? More than that. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of expertise on the table. Mr. Winkler, uh, when did yes, you come well, to? Well, uh, um, I imagine that your question uh, goes to our first physical contact or, or, or first travel to China, because it, that's, the, what, that's one of the takes of the question. Then uh, my first uh, contact was in 2006, if I remember correctly, maybe even in 2005. I was Minister for Trade in the government of uh, Romania and we were uh, negotiating our uh, accession to the European Union, which happened in 2007. But in the same time, uh, China, as for every uh, EU member and uh, would-be member, was, uh, was one of the first trading partners. It is still for Romania and for the whole European Union. So my first visit to China was in 2005, if I remember correctly. And if it's uh, in the sense that Luisa took it, uh, that to which was the first contact, then I would say then in communist Romania in the 80s, uh, Chinese uh, stuff was quite popular. For example, shirts or uh, pencils. So we had a lot of barter with China. We had a wonderful socialist friendship with China, of course, in that time. And, uh, and probably then uh, that... that that pencils and shirts were my first contact with uh, Chinese products. So, so I see textiles, Chinese textiles is the combining element here, uh, what brings us together. No, um, we, 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 we will t- today to talk about the future of EU-China uh, relations a bit with the title Back to Business as usual, question mark. As you know, we have been COVID now a couple of years and uh, trade has been halting there or it has been difficult with masks and so forth. There's been a new report which has been published by the European Parliament's research service titled EU-China 2030, a uh, European expert consultation on future relations uh, with China. And uh, this report is, is looking a little bit towards the future. And basically what it says is that the economic competition or the systemic rivalry would increase, uh, that the European Union would like to leverage more in order to get market access in, in China as well as secure its supply chains. So not a very rosy picture. But then on the other hand, if we look at the trade, the volumes or the foreign direct investments going into China and also from China partly going to Europe, we see a different uh, kind of picture. So um, my question goes to you, um, Luisa. Recently, the big companies like BASF, uh, BMW, Volkswagen have announced a lot of, um, a lot of uh, investments to China. Is this report wrong? No, I think uh, China is a very interesting market. It will remain a very interesting market. The fact that you have more investments in China for companies that are already in China means that these companies believe the market will continue to be a very important market in the future. If you are having more investment, it also means that probably you are thinking that it might be more difficult to supply the Chinese market from Europe from somewhere else. And I think that is going to be the biggest challenge 
for the coming years is how much you will still be able to serve China from outside China, both for reasons that have to do with China policy, because China is becoming also more uh, resilient uh, and uh, more self-sufficient. And this means as well that China is promoting more investments locally and less imports. And we also have, of course, all the restrictions that are increasing uh, from the US side, or export controls, uh, technology uh, transfers restrictions. And this is something we expect will increase in the future. Maybe Europe will follow suit a bit. And then, of course, we also have our unilateral initiatives, uh, initiatives like uh, the due diligence, for instance, or the forced uh, labor ban or forced product, forced the ban on products uh, made with forced labor. So all these initiatives will make, of course, also imports from China more difficult and more complicated. So it's a, it's also, it on one end, it means the market, the companies believe in the market. On the other end, they are preparing as well for the possibility that you might be, you might experience more problems in serving China from, from Europe in the future. You already touched about the, the supply chains uh, and, and a couple of the uh, legislative initiatives which, which we are planning here to I- increase our resilience, how you, how you put it. Um, I would go back to that later. I would still uh, stay with the general outlook here and, and, and ask you, um, Julio, I, I realized that you, you wrote an article in, in November 2021 where you wrote, I believe China should choose a path of structural and institutional reforms while recommitting to a business-friendly climate that allows European companies to compete on a level playing field. I'm underlining here the level playing field because this is something which has been said for many, many, many years now. Now, this article was published in November 21. Um, I think the world has changed since February 2022 when uh, the war in Ukraine started. Would you still write a text like this? Well, look, the content of the text is uh, not even mine because if we think at it, uh, commitments have been made by China and I speak about those commitments essentially. Uh, yes, there are also expectations from EU side. There are expectations from our companies. We can find those expectations in the EU CCC papers. We can find them in discussing with our uh, partners uh, from, from European business. So uh, essentially, uh, I would say, uh, yes, maybe with, not with those words, but uh, it's possible that me or somebody else writes down those sentences. Uh, in the same time, of course, the world has changed rapidly and we see a lot of... Uh, volatility uh, on the relations. We see certainly that uh, that uh, China continues being a cooperation partner if we look at the figures, because figures are increasing. Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, it's China or the US, the first trading partner of the European Union. It depends how you measure it, but on, on, on trading goods, uh, I think uh, China is today, as we speak, on the first place. And uh, 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 all those things uh, show us that what is happening on the other side of the balance, what is happening on the side of political relations, of side of values, what uh, the Ukraine war brought to us, those are all elements of volatility, which uh, of course uh, influence economic relations. Uh, so uh, we have to draw some conclusions. Uh, the first conclusion is that China is here to stay. So that's clear that we have to find a, a way of tackling all the, the issues, also the concrete issues uh, uh, signaled or pointed out uh, by, by our economic operators in China. Uh, we discuss so much about the um, balanced uh, relation, or the unbalanced realities of our EU-China relation. We discuss a lot about market access. We discuss a lot about uh, level playing field. We don't have them. Uh, we don't have them, and there is no reciprocity, and there is uh, still much more openness in Europe, I believe, than in the big majority of uh, markets globally. So uh, we have to take some action. We have to see how we can diversify. We have to see how we can, uh, well, we cannot make less volatility, but we can build some insurances for companies, and, uh, and, and uh, we have to do that. And also there is, uh, uh, when discussing about, uh, about diversification, there is uh, uh, the big question, with whom should we diversify? How do we make our choices? Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, all those are open questions, which uh, maybe I think uh, point to a direction in which the 
EU-China relations put us a lot of questions, but the answers are not only in the bilateral EU-China relations, but are uh, also in the global action of the European Union. So it's uh, more complex than just a bilateral uh, relation uh, of the EU or of its member states. I would, I, I would take you up on that because you mentioned that there still is no reciprocity, and, and one of the medic uh, or one of the medicines what the European Union wanted to do in order to gain access was the comprehensive agreement on investments um, uh, together with uh, with China, and that was actually signed already and it was going into force but then um, the, Euro- the European Union sanctions China on human rights issues in Xinjiang and there's been counter sanctions including in the European Parliament from the Chinese side so one could say that it's been it's been buried so now with the new situation we talk about de-risking diversification do you think uh, Luisa that for the European companies the Kai is still relevant should we still go back to that time and try to push for the Kai? Well, at the moment, there are no political conditions for that uh, to start with. So uh, until China lifts the sanctions on the members of the European Parliament, that is not really an option. If China lifts these sanctions, then we can discuss and reassess whether the CHI is still uh, worth or not. I mean, the political environment has changed significantly. The perception of what China is doing also we keep on saying that uh, the agreement itself, it was, mm, it was much more in terms of commitments from China, also binding commitments in terms of market access, but particularly on rules, was much further than China had ever done before. So that's why the agreement had a meaning. It means that we were still thinking that we could improve the access of European business to China. We were still in a logic that we believed we could improve the legal environment for investments of European companies in China. And we were still uh, in, the accept- in the perception that China would try to uh, implement its commitments and actually would try to do the reforms that allowed its economy to open more. But in the meantime, I think also the policies in China have changed. Um, We are not sure, of course, the Chinese keep saying that they would like uh, to ratify the CHI. But the question we also have is, is the CHI and the CHI commitments still in line with the recent policies of China? This is something I think we we need to understand as well. Because in the, meantime, in the meantime, China is also taking a much more state-driven approach in terms of the economy. It's, it's an increased politicization also of the economy. So companies feel that they also are under pressure, political pressure from the government, and have less possibility to act according to the market rules. Do you have any examples you could give on that? Because I find it very interesting what you said, that China has changed since the early adoption phase or the signature phase of CHI. What, what has happened since since then? What do you find specifically uh, difficult for European industries? I think, well, some of the measures are also impacting Chinese companies. You have more and more... You, you had from many times, uh, already some time ago, the presence of party cells within the companies. But of course, now they are becoming more active as well. Then you have uh, a number of uh, rules and legislations that give more control uh, to the government, to the central government, and one area, for instance, in the procurement area, Mm -hmm. on um, medical devices, for instance, where you see that uh, at sub-federal level uh, you have less uh, leverage to negotiate. So This means that there is more control from the state. So these are some of the elements. Of course, everything has to do with uh, uh, security, with intelligence, with uh, access to information is becoming much more controlled at central level. So also the the information sharing uh, is becoming more difficult. Um, So all this means that China wants and the central government wants to have more of a control of the whole economy. And this, of course, impacts also Chinese companies, including including the private companies. And 
we see that there is more and more of a, a tendency from the government to give more power to state-owned enterprises. Many of them, of course, are not really even sustainable from a business and economic point of view, but they are being uh, promoted even for the, for the, by the government precisely because the government trusts them to implement more uh, clearly their policies. That's an interesting fact. I'll, I'll take that up. Uh, and and, and I, I asked you first because uh, Mr. Winkler, of course, was the standing rapporteur, one of the uh, political decision makers behind the CHI. So my next question, of course, uh, hearing what just Louisa said, um, also taking into account uh, the very prominent case of uh, anti-coercion or the coercion of Lithuanian industries and Lithuania as a country, do we even have a political will anymore on the member state level to push this thing through? So, uh, uh, first, uh, first a few uh, introductory ideas. I uh, still am the standing rapporteur of the, uh, of the EU-China relations. So, if wherever the comprehensive agreement of investment will reach the European Parliament, in this mandate, of course, which ends in uh, May next year, yeah. uh, I will be the rapporteur of, of this. Uh, secondly, you said that, it, I, I, I remember, I just noted that it was going to enter into force. No, it was going to enter into the ratification process because that's the exact situation when the, the sanctions came. Uh, then we, of course, reacted because uh, this was a very uh, immediate reaction and a very united reaction of the European Parliament, regardless about the people, the persons, or the subcommittee uh, uh, that was uh, sanctioned. We uh, acted in solidarity. We said instantly that no, this is a no-go. Now we have uh, this agreement in the freezer, and it uh, can be taken out from there only when the political situation of the sanctions is changing. So for the moment, it did not change, so we, uh, we, we cannot... Uh, and consider any of the next steps. But we know very well which the next steps would be once the political situation is, is solved, if it will be solved. And uh, it's the case, uh, we also read them in various reports, we read them in the papers of the EUCCC, the European Union uh, Chamber of Commerce in China, that there is still a case for an investment agreement. And if we remember what are our problems, basically in a short sentence, on balance, uh, 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 lack of reciprocity, uh, lack of level playing field, all those problems are still there. They, they are still even deepening in the last period. They are not uh, going towards uh, some solutions, but they are going towards uh, uh, more and more problems and deeper problems. So there would be, or there should be a case for the uh, investment agreement. Of course, in the same time, uh, uh, discussing about what is happening, uh, about the content of, of, of a possible agreement. Uh, do we need something like this? Yes, we need also from the rules point of view. And you spoke, Louisa, about the rules. And I think this is very important because at the end of the day, I think, what is a, the European Union? It's a rules-based organization, mm -hmm. if we want to simplify. So we can thrive in a rules-based environment. Do we have some rules in our relation with China? Uh, not really. Of course, we have the, the general chapeau of the WTO. Of course, we have a GI's agreement. We have a geographic mm -hmm. indications agreement, but that's a very, very thin sectorial thing. It does not ensure really uh, any of our problems getting closer to be solved. Yeah. So, so that is the case of this. And it's clear that, that uh, uh, our uh, economic and trade relation in this moment as we speak with China is indispensable. So, uh, yes, uh, I don't know if I can be now optimistic or pessimistic. I don't know. To, I, I, I'm not able to, to distinguish even. We have this new ambassador in Brussels, the new mm. Chinese ambassador. But is he delivering messages or it's more that he makes some noises after his arrival and, and uh, taking up the new... So it's very difficult to, to, to understand those things. But what we see is that this di discrepancy between economic and trade realities and political uh, realities is uh, really increasing. And just to finish with this, when we speak about uh, uh, rules, about reforms, about what we need to happen in China, we also always have to speak in terms of enforceability. And that is very tricky. Uh, 
I was 25 in 1989, so I know something about, I mean, when Romania changed the regime. So I know something about central planned economy and socialist states. And I can tell you, enforceability of the reforms stated on paper by, by, by our Chinese uh, partners, whenever we will reach that point, that will be also very, very tricky. So it's funny that you mentioned, I think, in a recent speech, Ursula von der Leyen mentioned that China is a state-led capital, a capitalist system. I would be very happy to talk with you if that's even possible or what that would actually entail. But instead of going to that direction, I would like to go back to hard political facts uh, and, and take up the point of resiliency, what Luis also men- mentioned earlier. So we have seen a couple of legisl- legislative proposals coming out from the Commission in the last days. One of them is targeting raw materials. Uh, so the Raw Materials Act of the European Union says that we should be independent of one uh, supplier of raw materials. It doesn't name China as the main beneficiary of this act, but it's quite clear that when you look where the raw materials are coming from, I have numbers, 97% of lithium, what we use for batteries, coming from China. Uh, 98% of all of the rare earths uh, are coming from China, all the minerals, and the EU wants to cut this dependency down to 65% from one supplier, meaning China in, in these cases, what I just mentioned. So, Julia, I take you again up. Uh, I, I would start with you as here, because um, on the one hand, I understand that the CHI is something that increases European business uh, possibilities to work in a rules-based order in China, are the political facts pointing to that direction? Do we even want that? Well, that's a good question. Uh, uh, first, I would uh, I would argue with you, not against the numbers, but still, uh, uh, critical raw materials problem is not a China problem. It is a China problem too, but it is also much more complex than this. Uh, then, uh, basically, then it, if it's not a China problem, what is it? Uh, I think it's a dependency problem. And as COVID showed us, and then later, unfortunately, the, the Russian war in uh, aggression in Ukraine showed us, vulnerability instantly becomes, uh, dependencies instantly become vulnerabilities in a crisis situation, in war situation, in coronavirus or, or other pandemic situation. So we have to tackle those. Uh, the political will, and you ask me about China in this context, the political will... I think that's a very complex discussion because if we look, then we see that also among EU institutions and among Brussels and the member states' capitals, there are significant differences. And we see to our uh, big China stakeholder, which is Germany, of course, Mm -hmm. uh, which is at the origins of the uh, Wandel durch Handel idea. That was also towards Russia, but was also, obviously, towards China. And that was also an idea that I embraced uh, personally very, very gladly, because I, and I still believe that there is some potential in such an idea. Uh, So, uh, so, uh, uh, is there political will? Could there be the conditions for that political will to be, for example, a majority in the European Parliament? That's debatable. It depends on what happens. You uh, just uh, we were just discussing before starting this uh, yeah. this live show that uh, that uh, there will be several high level visits in China in the following days. Those visits will bring us something. I mean, I think uh, uh, Commission President von der Leyen or the, uh, the French President Macron or the, our High Representative Borrell, they should come back with something because I think they have an idea when they go to China. Now, we saw uh, President von der Leyen hinting to some of her ideas. Uh, We need a China strategy. Uh, We are maybe waiting to see what Germany will tell, because as I told you, Berlin is quite important uh, in in all all this equation. So uh, uh, this makes the whole issue very volatile, very complex. And uh, and, uh, uh, in these conditions, I think that we are right to, and we have to act simultaneously on several uh, uh, initiatives or on several directions. We have to diversify our trading partners. We have to find those trading partners that uh, are able to f- supply us with critical raw materials or necessary or strategic raw materials in the context of the double transition. But we also have to do some things at home. We have to see what is about how people think in Europe about industry. What about the reindustrialization strategies of the European Union and its member states? 
how can we convince the public, which in my take became extremely green, but the general public became green without really, in my take, uh, understanding the implications, the deep implications of deindustrializing. Why should not we uh, uh, exploit our own resources because we have them fully in Europe? And finally, how how can we uh, uh, not only uh, uh, change mentalities, not only reindustrialize, but how can we build up the circular economy and what can it bring to us? Because for the moment, I think we are unsure, technically speaking, about how much of the critical raw materials uh, necessities could be covered in future, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, with new technologies from yeah. the circular economy. You mentioned now um, the industrialization and so forth. But I, that, that's all valid points. I will still go back a little bit because this is a China-related discussion to kind of the dependencies that we have. I know that the very good sentence, what you just mentioned, dependencies come vulnerabilities. We need to diversify. We need to de-risk, as the commission uh, has, has put it um, in, in recent communications. So now I'm turning to the business side um, of the table again and fully knowing that you are not representing Germany here or German companies, but I would like to take out of my home country an example, Volkswagen, which has around 40% of global revenues and have pretty much the same amount of global profits based in China and has also announced for more, um, for more um, investments in China. Is this how European diversification and de-risking looks like? Well, uh, the companies are free to, to take their own decisions uh, and uh, we don't and should not mingle in the decisions of the companies because they know better what their business model is and what could be the success factors in the future. What we are saying is, of course, we are giving uh, indications of what are the challenges ahead in our relations with, with China. We do have a very complex relation, it's true. Uh, we, we depend... Uh, on some critical raw materials from China. But also, I, I, I tend to say that uh, China also depends on our market to sell a lot of their goods. So it's not that this is dependency works also only on one way. Uh, it also works in our favor. So I also think we need to use more that leverage that we have because, of course, China cannot afford to lose their two main markets, and that's the US and Europe. China is not yet and cannot yet only depend on its own market if they want to continue to grow at an enough pace to continue to have jobs for their citizens and improve the livelihood of their citizens. So I think this is also important. Then we need, of course, to, and I totally agree with what Julia said, we need to diversify. And, and this is, we need to mitigate the risk. And we have, for sure, to look for alternatives in Europe when they exist. But we also need to be very clear that some of these alternatives in Europe will not be easy, will not happen from one day to the other, and they might be more costly. So we need to see if there are other partners there which could be an alternative to China or to other countries with which we depend too much. And that's why we also think it is really the moment to push for our bilateral trade agenda when it comes to trade agreements. We need not only to, in, to have more partners with which we can trade in terms of imports and having more access to raw materials, talking about lithium, Chile is definitely mm -hmm. an alternative as well. We also need, of course, to look for other alternatives for our exports. If the situation with China or other markets becomes more difficult, we will need to find alternatives. And therefore, I, I think an agreement, for instance, like Mercosur, is one that could be really a, a real alternative, as well as India, if we manage to, to do something with India. So we need to have a mix of policies. And this has always been what we have defended with, with China. We need to be using our own leverage as Europe. And this also means we need to talk with one voice. So it's very good that President von der Leyen goes with President Macron. This means that there is some alignment between the EU and a, a member state, because some, well, in the past we saw a lot of situations where member states were going to China and, and then we had contradictory views. So it's very important that we speak with, with one voice, that we align our policies and we align our dialogue and our message vis-a-vis -vis China. 
It's also important that we will continue to engage with China. I mean, the worst we can have is a situation where we don't talk, we start building more and more frictions, and this could eventually lead to more problems. We need to, we have an interest in engaging with China. I mean, global challenges like climate change, even standardization, I mean, these are areas where we have an interest in engaging with China. And, and I think we should not close the door to this dialogue. On the contrary, whenever possible, we need, to, we need to go deeper, being quite realistic and pragmatic to understand that maybe China does not share the same model. It's very clear, the, the same political model, even the same economic model. So we need to be pragmatic, but this doesn't mean closing the dialogue. I, I have one question which I will uh, present uh, to, to Julio here, Mr. Julio Winkler. Um, Luisa basically uh, announced a couple of priorities which she, uh, on behalf of Business Europe, thinks is very important to engaging. Uh, you mentioned trade agreements, you mentioned diversification, you, you, you mentioned openness of markets, uh, engaging with other partners, just a couple of examples. So looking at elections, as we are uh, looking at European elections in the year 2024, why should or should Europeans care about the economic uh, discrepancies between Europe and China? How does this look for a normal person's viewpoint? I think uh, many of our citizens are attentive to China, to problems related to China. By the other hand, uh, you know that uh, any politician sitting in this chair would tell you that all elections are local. So it's uh, very clear that uh, if I go back to 2014, then uh, the TTIP, the Transatlantic mm. Partnership, was really a, a, an election topic in the European elections in 2014. TTIP and CETA, but where? In Germany and France mainly, and in some other Western European countries. It was zero degree topic in Romania or in Bulgaria or in Hungary, in Eastern Europe. So clearly, uh, we might speak about those issues uh, like, uh, for example, linked of dependencies in Romania, that is a public talk about depend, being dependent on China, on solar panels, on inverters, or on uh, electric cars, or batteries, and so on. Uh, then I think uh, the climate change issues are popular in other member states. I mean, it's clearly that you cannot really uh, tackle my, uh, climate change without China, because it's so huge, and because it's such a big polluter. Then in maybe other uh, member states, uh, the situation of counterfeit products linked with China or the situation of uh, debatable production methods, human rights, uh, uh, child labor, forced labor and so on, also linked with China could be also problems in the platform of the political parties. But finally I would say, so I think in each member states you will have differences. Uh, probably China could be or will be a bigger or a smaller issue in elections, depending on the member states. But what I would say to all uh, uh, European citizens uh, now, if I could, is the following. Uh, it's clear that China, together with Russia, are the main actors on the disinformation market and the fake news market in all European Union member states. Probably we are closer, I mean Eastern Europe is closer to Russia and it's subjected to more Russian interference, but uh, a Chinese interference, as it was also debated and proved in the, the committee uh, of the European Parliament, which was working with foreign interference, uh, it's clearly an actor present in all the member states and probably this presence will be increasing mm -hmm. as we uh, come closer and closer to the elections. I took from this uh, topics, trade relations will continue with China. We are pushing for equal market access. We are trying to be more autonomous, uh, be aware of our risks that we have there. And for elections, look for trade uh, topics, look for disinformation topics and make uh, your politicians aware that China and Russia are a major player in this. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you both for taking the time today, for coming here. I think we all learned something and we should build on these China competencies and make both the politicians and the public more aware why do we need to engage. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>